I think it's important to tell my story because it's a message of hope. I hope that I can, if inspire one other person to maybe make a change in their lives and show up for themselves in a different way and believe in themselves, then, then this, is, this is worth it for me. You know, the way I look at happiness is it's a fleeting emotion, just like sadness. You have to experience one to experience the other. So I've been able to come to a place in my life where I legitimately live most of my life in peace. This is an environment that's elusive to most of humanity, let alone those that have suffered immensely. My childhood was one that, that was, I mean, from the outside looking in, picture perfect. My parents were absolutely incredible. My dad hardworking and, and my mom hardworking also as a nurse. I mean, my parents dedicated their lives to their, to their children, to me and my sister Shannon. It's, you know, I was, started playing hockey at a young age as a Canadian boy. That's something that, you know, is revered and kind of what everyone does up here. But it was just a really, really beautiful upbringing. It was a really beautiful environment, really supportive. We weren't really pressured. We were able to just kind of, you know, become our own people. They set the tone, structure and foundation for me to live a good life. The rest was up to me. Hockey for me as, a, as an adolescence and teenager was everything. It literally was my life. There's nothing else. It's the only thing that I was, was really focused on. It's what I had been groomed to be. Uh, and you really don't have much time for anything else. I mean, to play hockey at a high caliber at that age, you, you don't have a life. You, you just, it's just hockey. That's it, that's all that it is. First year of junior hockey was absolutely incredible. I could do no wrong. Being drafted to the OHL by Ottawa, it was a uh, rodeo. Ottawa back then was a, it was a free-for-all. It was like the Wild West playing with the 67s. Coming into that organization with, a, with just a real great culture, and we ended up winning the Memorial Cup that year. For a first year player in junior hockey in the OHL, you couldn't script it any better. Like I scored a goal in the Memorial Cup too, so that was nice to get on the game sheet. Finally evened it up with a couple of right hands of his own. But Luke Sellers is upset with a hit on Moyer, who looks to have a shoulder problem. Coming back from my second year, what transpired is not what I expected, let's put it that way. Immediately coming into training camp, the tone was a little bit different with my coach. Very quickly I realized that I was the whipping boy that year. I always seemed to be one guy that was a top player in Ottawa that was just getting grinded non-stop by the coaches. It was terrible. When you're, when you're getting emotionally and verbally abused by people that you look up to and hold your future in their hands, like, you know, I downplayed it a lot of my life, just how detrimental my second and third year junior hockey were for my psyche, for my emotional stability. You know, being made fun of by, by my coach for every little thing or being come down upon. And, you know, back then in a locker room, it's your teenage boys and, you know, the, you have the chauvinism of it and the, and it's just, you got to suck it up. And, and it was old time hockey there. If you walked, you played and if you won, you drank. So having injuries questioned by your coaching staff and, and things like that, it was just, it was, it was brutal. It was, and it's, and it's left a real lasting effect on me that, that no matter what you do, you're just not good enough. Coming off my junior career, I don't think I really was giving enough emphasis to the amount of abuse that I had, that I had suffered uh, in my second and third year in Ottawa. And really at that point, <laughs> what kid would be looking in that direction? I just signed my first NHL contract after being a 30th overall pick as an 18 year old to Atlanta. And my signing bonus was a half million bucks. And that's when things really started to, to, to go in a different direction. I got introduced to cocaine. Yeah, I had a, I had a surgery, um, I was around 11 or 12 years of age to correct something that was called a varicocele. Basically something that's going on in the testicle. And they go in and they cut into your stomach. 
Now, when they stitched me up, really the byproduct of it is, is in my adolescence and that where most young men are getting erections and getting turned on and aroused, I wasn't. As a young man throughout my adolescence and teenager, getting aroused for sex wasn't something that really came naturally. Uh, I really have to think about it to, 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 to get aroused when, you know, when I was 14, 15, 16 years of age. So when I first did cocaine, it was like, it was like opening the floodgates. And I think attempting to, you know, just cover up my own pain, my own suffering, I'm not thinking I was good enough. I got mixed up and, and was spending time in a lot of, a lot of environments, after hours clubs, places where, you know, heavy drug use was used in. And I, I ended up getting roofied and raped by two men that same summer, just months after signing. It was an experience that um, at the time I denied even happened, but I you know, woke up after the incident with the obvious trauma and, and uh, being able to see that something had occurred. That was real tough for me that I didn't give credit to and I didn't really look at it because I didn't want to, I didn't want to accept it. There I was now in a professional locker room and as a young man that always had difficulty getting aroused and questioning my sexuality, questioning did I ask for that to happen, did I put myself in that position and you know I was I was pissed off at the world, I went overboard, I, I tried to do everything more so than, than the other guys and, and in the sense of off the ice, drinking, partying, sleeping with women to try to kind of fill the void of not feeling good enough, not feeling seen, not feeling like a man. My third year of pro hockey in Chicago, I, for lack of a better way of saying it, I'd finally figured out what it was to be a pro. And I, and I believe it showed. Like with all things, stuff catches up with you. I mean, you can't not take care of yourself for years and years and expect your body to perform. And it started to deteriorate. I had a, a real bad case of patella tendinitis. The awareness of our training staff in Chicago and strength and conditioning, we didn't even have a strength and conditioning guy back then. So it was the typical, you rest things, you ice it. And it wasn't getting better. And we were getting close to the playoffs. It was the last year of my contract and I hadn't proven myself in the first two years. So I looked outside of the Atlanta Thrashers organization and the Chicago Wolves and ended up hooking up with the doctor for the Chicago Bulls who was doing a, a type of surgery that was kind of new. Post-surgery, I was attempting to rehab real quick because we had the playoffs coming on while well, just trying to loosen things up in my legs after trying to get on the ice quickly. I picked up this bacteria, this staph infection. For those that have never experienced staph, it's like getting hit by a freight train. The thing about it was is that this infection had been in my knee for probably a good week to 10 days. And I'll never forget the look on the nurse's face when she saw me walk in. It was like one of absolute shock. So I obviously didn't look too good. I'll never forget, I was just gazing off at that, that hospital room TV as he's telling me, you know, Mr. Sellers, and he's kind of skirting around. And I remember saying to him, I said, just tell it to me straight, like what's going on here? He said, what we've given you is as much antibiotics as your body can take. And, you know, if the antibiotics don't start to work in about the next 10 to 12 hours, we're going to have to amputate your leg. <laughs> but what, what transpired over the next few weeks were probably some of the most difficult weeks of my life, and not because of the injury, but because not one single person in the organization came to see me in that hospital room. Not one of my teammates, not a coach, not a trainer. It was like in that moment I realized what pro sports really was. Like, you're literally a number. There's no humanness in it. And, and it's, it's really served me well later in life because I always remember that moment. I never felt smaller in my life than in those few weeks in that hospital room where I've gone to war with these guys. My whole life had been dedicated to be, to be an athlete, to be a hockey player, and, and I was lost. I, all that I had known as a man, as a, as a human being on this planet was hockey, and now it wasn't there, it was gone. And the whole hockey community saw me as a failure. I didn't believe in myself. And, and in that moment, I realized no one else really believed in me either. And it was, it was tough. However, it's, uh, I think these moments in life that, that we can really, really see the making of a man, so. So here I am in Chicago now, the two years after that injury and I don't have a profession. I'm living in this illusion that I'm gonna get back healthy and play. And I'm living in downtown Chicago. 
I mean, self-medication was my way. It's how I got through things. The drinking and the cocaine use at that point was just absolutely astronomically out of control. I mean, I was using coke daily, uh, and then with cocaine womanizing because they went hand in hand for me. Cocaine made me feel like a man, made me feel powerful, made me feel aroused. And, and naturally, as a pro athlete, there's women around a lot. So, and I was living with a woman. Like, I turned into an absolute trash bag. I did had no regard for other people. I had no regard for myself. And I was pissed off at the world. I was blaming everyone else for my problems. So I just drank more, did more coke, did more stupid things. This is where I really went into a spiral of darkness. I didn't want to live. I would fantasize about suicide. I would fantasize about what it would like to not have to wake up every morning and, and be in so much pain. I would fantasize, I would research and look up what would be the, the best way to kill myself. <laughs> the most fucked up about it was what would be the most painful way to kill myself as opposed to going quickly. I was distorted, I was morbid. I had suffered significant head traumas that back then no one really understood. I would pick fights in bars with guys that were bigger than me because pain was the only way that I could feel. I, I never knew anything else. I remember fighting one guy outside of a bar. He got to his car and pulled a gun out of his car and had it pointing right at my forehead. And I literally felt the, 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 the feel of the metal on my forehead. And in that moment, the only thing that I could feel was, please do it. Like, please. He didn't. And it, it's, it's a place to be when, when you don't want to live, you begin to fantasize about it. You don't see clearly. I couldn't stand the fact that I wasn't somebody special anymore. I think it just got to the point where I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I figured that if it was a drug overdose, that it would at least be something that my family could accept as an accident and not something that was intentional. However, my planning of it was intentional. I was done with this fucking world. I was done with it. I was, I didn't see how life could ever, ever be good. So I did it, popped all the pills, did the coke, drank the alcohol and waited to die. As I faded off in consciousness and the room started to slip away from me, I was, I was ready. I was ready to leave. And then I woke up. And fuck, the first thing I thought, I mean, I'm still high and fucked up. I'm thinking, fuck, you can't even fucking get this right. And at this point, I don't have very little drugs left in the room. I can't leave the room because I'm so fucking paranoid now and messed up from being up for three days and the amount of drugs that I just did. The fact that I was still here, I just couldn't fucking wrap my head around it. And it was in that moment I felt this energy inside of me that was something along the lines like, are you sure? <laughs> I'm sitting there looking into my own eyes and I'm still blaming the rest of the world for all of my problems and, you know, thinking it's their fault and, you know, I got a raw deal. And, and then in that moment there was just something that came through me and it was like this light bulb went off and it's just like, no, dude, that guy right in front of you, he's the fucking problem. He's the problem. And it was like, I was two different people for a moment. Of course, in that moment, I started thinking, hey, you're not the problem, you're the, you're the solution. And it's like, well, fuck, wait a minute. If I'm the solution, then I must be the problem. From that moment moving forward, I started to take full ownership for everything in my life, whether I liked it or didn't like it, the things that I did good, the things that I did bad, the things that happen any which way I want to look at it. I realized that I was the problem to my own life. I was the one that created all of the issues. <laughs> and in that moment, there was this sense of liberation that came through me. It was just like, I'm the answer. I'm the answer. To my own hardships, my own suffering, I caused them. Well, what's to say that I can't create beautiful things in my life? I got so inspired in that moment and it's, I do mirror work every morning where I look in, look into my own eyes and I say, I've been doing this for almost a decade now. now. Today will be the day that everything I think I know will be proven wrong. And it's a model that I live by a mantra because it served me so well. That man that was looking in that mirror blaming the rest of the world, I thought I knew the answers. I thought I knew how life functioned and I 
had no clue. I think it's a big issue most men deal with, trying to act like they know the answers. I knew nothing. So continuing to live my life in this way, it's just, it's just such a great inspiration, knowing that I am the problem <laughs> and the answer to my whole life. Darkness breathes light and light breathes darkness. Without one, you can't have the other. The minute that I accepted that fully, things really began to change. All of these experiences that, that have occurred for us have all happened in a way for us to live in the light. However, we have to be willing to exist in the darkness. It's, it's the only way. It's been about 10 years since I've stepped onto the ice and I felt it fitting for it to be a Ted Reeve arena where I played the majority of my minor hockey with the Wexford Raiders and just bringing back a lot of memories right now but it's fitting to be here at this rink where really the most formal years of my hockey and minor hockey existed and with great mentors and coaches it was just it was it was a lot of fun the memories are, are sitting here the nostalgia of it is just I can remember you know goals that I scored here when I was 12 and I didn't score too many of them <laughs> or big games that we had here and played against our rival rivals the, the Toronto Red Wings the Toronto Marlies the Young Nats and just the guys that I was fortunate enough enough to sit on this bench with some of those guys aren't alive anymore so it's just a beautiful experience so hockey was something for a very long time that um, I wasn't interested in looking at I wouldn't watch hockey games I wasn't interested in talking about it <laughs> When you had everyone around you asking you, well, what happened? What happened? What happened? You know, you're a guy who was supposed to play a lot of years with a lot of money, and here you are, more or less out of the game. But over time, as I started to shift the focus and attention to my well-being and showing up for myself and living in accordance with nature and in the way that we're meant to, I've come back around to the game of hockey and, and what I loved about it as a kid. And I don't have the attachment to it as the man that did when I was 20. There's not a competitive bone to a degree in my body anymore. So I'm just excited to live and experience each moment. Uh, and, and, and I enjoy all kinds of different games. I was a man that was blaming the entire world for all of my issues. And once I had had that, that aha moment and realizing that I was the problem, that I was also the answer. It's an interesting insight to have because if that's gonna be the way you live your life, then you gotta look at every single experience that's happened in your life and that you're the one that actually created it or magnetized it into your life. As I started to live my life as a responsible man as opposed to a victim, as I began to focus on being vulnerable to invoke the courage i started to go in and unpack all of these different experiences i've had in my life it's and it's it's been a a daunting journey but one that has allowed me to come to a space and an environment that every single thing that has occurred in my life to this point here i have worked cleaned it gone into the shadow of it all to really redeem that aspect of myself to bring that part back into me on the outside looking in, my life would be perceived as a failure, or at least my professional career as a hockey player. Sports, it's an interesting thing. You really look at it. You're always chasing and attempting to achieve something, a lot like the way life for everybody today is, where that next paycheck, that next experience, and this way of living, is, it creates this level of anxiety. We're looking to the future to define our, our life or to the past. You can see it time and time again that when we live our lives in this competitive way without any real centeredness, 
that, that it, it doesn't suffice us. It's, it's difficult. Everybody's in pain. Everybody's suffering. The thing I really want to make clear here is that every experience of our lives is a gift. Every experience that I've had, the darkness, the light, I would not change one aspect of it because it's helped shape me into who I am today. And, and I, I like who I am today, which is a, a big statement for a guy that's that's not liked himself so much and done a lot of really bad shit to people. My life and every moment of it is a gift and, and I'm so grateful to be here to experience it and share it with others.